Now, before I give you my thoughts on SummerSlam 2017, the WrestleMania of the summer, couple of items to touch on. First off, if you're looking for something to do tonight after you watch this preview video, of course, tomorrow as you're waiting for SummerSlam, even after SummerSlam, make sure you check out the SummerSlam review series. It's got every SummerSlam review from 1988 all the way up to 2016. Second, make sure you check out my appearance on the, I think it's Wrestling Ramble podcast, whatever the hell it's called, my buddy Steve. Uh, it was a great time. I joined in about an hour and 15 minutes in, and we went another two hours plus, and we talked about wrestling and so much more. If you want to have some fun, you want to have a hell of a time, make sure you check that out. Anyways, speaking of good time and hoping to hell that a good time awaits me Sunday night, we get to SummerSlam 2017. Please don't let this show suck. Because if it does... That is an awful lot of my Sunday night wasted for a crap show. I'm just saying. And and the whole thing, getting on the, it's a lot of show. Two hours of pre-show. Minimum four hours of the main card, knowing there's a very good chance that this might run over to 11.15, 11.30. That's a lot. Especially for those people that have watched NXT TakeOver Brooklyn the night before. That's an awful lot of wrestling to watch in a very short period of time. And even looking ahead to SummerSlam, knowing that there's a possibility that this show could run to 11.30 or midnight, hell, who knows, and that I was going to want to review it immediately afterwards, it kind of forced me to take Monday off of work. Even if I wasn't doing the review that night, just from the standpoint of watching SummerSlam and getting all the way through SummerSlam, it was going to take me a while to wind down whether the show was good or bad or not. It's tough shit. It really is. Um, hopefully, the time will be well spent. Hopefully. But honestly, I don't have my hopes up. And one of my frustrations with this year's show is it felt like the WWE jumped the gun with so many things heading into this event. You know, where the real kind of special attraction, uh, once in a lifetime type of matches. You know, other than maybe the main event for the Universal title, I don't see anything else that really truly has a big match feel to it. A lot of these matches are repetitive from previous pay-per-views or in some cases from this week's Raw and SmackDown. It's like the WWE couldn't wait to undercut this show by giving away a lot of the crap already during the week. Just frustrating. But then you expect people to subscribe to your network and watch the pay-per-views. Why would you? Frankly, why would you? And I expect as time goes along, as the company does this more and more, fewer and fewer people are going to bother to watch the events live. Because again, why would you? They're either going to spoil it and give that crap to you beforehand, or they're going to give it to you immediately on the following week's show. Where is the urgency, the importance placed, the premium placed on watching these events? I'm just saying. So anyways, enough of the ramble and crap. Let's talk about the show. The kickoff show. All two hours of it. Surely we will get plenty of lame panel crap. Now, I haven't even determined if I'm going to watch the pre-show or not. I'm leaning towards probably not, because especially if I did watch it, I'm going to watch all two hours of it. And then you're talking about at least six plus hours of WWE. And I'm sorry, watching six plus hours straight of football can be taxing enough on a Sunday afternoon. And football, sure as hell, even on its worst day, is a whole hell of a lot better than today's WWE. It's a very, very big ask indeed. Um, but you look at this pre-show, to me it's just ridiculous. You've got the Usos and the New Day fighting for the SmackDown Tag Team Championship, being rewarded for their efforts on Battleground, the one real highlight of that show, with a pre-show tag title match here at one of the big four pay-per-views. And what's really ridiculous about it is who's actually more interesting, who's actually more over? Is it... Rollins and Ambrose and Sheamus and Cesaro? Or is it New Day and the Usos? It's the New Day and the Usos, and it's not even close. If one of these tag title matches deserved to be on the main card, it wasn't the Raw one, that's for goddamn sure. What a hell of a way to incentivize your employees. Hey, you were clearly the highlight of the last pay-per-view. You guys, for a lot of people, tore the house down. You're the one real positive we had that everybody kind of latched onto. 
So next time, we're going to bump you off of the main card. Why the fuck would anybody care at that point in time? Just a completely demotivating uh, issue right there. Just unbelievable. Then you've got a cruiserweight championship where, again, what's the fucking point of this now? Because you already spoiled it by having Tozawa win the belt Monday night. Either Neville wins it back and it's stupid, or Tozawa retains and you took away something that could have made this big event feel even bigger and special for the guy. And who in the fuck am I kidding? It doesn't matter because the match was still going to be on the pre-show anyways. Like, if you're Neville, you have to say, in terms of your abilities as a performer and your production as a performer over the past six months to a year, it is a crying shame, cruiserweight or not, cruiserweight champion or not, you know, recently dethroned cruiserweight champion, you're one of the best all-around performers the WWE has right now, and that's a fact. And to sit there time after time after time and get pigeonholed in this kickoff show slot is a complete slap in the fucking face and ridiculous. And speaking of ridiculous, the Hardy Boys go from being one of the real highlights with their return at WrestleMania 33 to now at SummerSlam, just a little over four and a half months later, they're working the kickoff show in a fuck all who gives a crap match. And you can sit there and blame it on the revival not being there it doesn't matter because they probably would have still been on the damn pre-show anyways. The Miz is on the pre-show and it's ridiculous too that Jason Jordan is on the pre-show. His dad is the freaking general manager of Raw and his dad can't even get him a featured spot on the card? I mean, just from a storyline standpoint, that makes no sense. But just from a company standpoint, your mid-card MVP Miz... And one of the greatest and most popular tag teams in wrestling history, the Hardy Boys, are all serving as curtain jerkers, as appetizers to the entree, which is the main card. Unbelievable. And what's crazy is, you look at the main card, and even with the three kickoff matches, you still have, what, like fucking nine, ten matches on the main show? Holy Christ. That's a lot. That is a lot. And you're still going to have probably very questionable flow where some matches are too short. Some matches go way too fucking long because the WWE doesn't know how to manage its time and construct a properly flowing show on a consistent basis anymore. Well, let's take a look at the whiz banger that is the main card, which is going to be a whole lot of circle jerking and who gives a crap until, frankly, we get to the universal title match. And that's just the way I see it. I do hope that Bray Wyatt and Finn Balor is somewhere in the middle of the show because to me, what's going to be a long night no matter what kickoff show or not, I'm going to need a piss shit slash smoke slash walk the dog break at some point in time during the night. So if WWE could do me a favor and put this match on somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time Sunday night, I would greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Because this is clearly the designated bathroom break for myself and or the dogs. Because honestly, once Bray Wyatt makes his entrance and once Demon Finn Balor makes his fucking entrance, who gives a shit about the rest of the match? Who wins? Nobody that watches it, but probably Finn Balor. Then you've got the match where somebody within WWE, Vince, Kevin, I don't know, Somebody's been watching too much Jim Crockett promotions. We're going to have a shock case, baby. But we're going to vince a fight because we're going to take somebody else's idea. And we're going to ruin it and put our stamp on it. Like, how ridiculous is it that you take a shark cage stipulation, which was designed to lock the heel up? And in this case, you're putting, in theory, the babyface Enzo, which is probably a statement by the company. They're trying to put him in there because they view him as a heel backstage. But seriously, like, this is just dumb. And the big ass versus the big slow, I couldn't give a fuck less about this match. I almost am going to hope that Big Show wins. Honestly, I'm sure I'm sure um, big ass will win and it, it'll be whatever and it'll probably be most definitely forgettable. Speaking of forgettable, Randy Orton has had quite a stretch here recently of forgettable bad pay-per-view matches. And is that crappy pay-per-view match streak going to continue for the Viper going against R Rusev? I think this is probably where this bad pay-per-view match streak ends. This probably will be a sneaky good match. Maybe we'll remember it as one of the better matches of the night. Um, a lot of people feel that Rusev 
has to go over, should go over, but we are dealing with breakfast club business bitches, and at some point in time, Orton's going to want a victory somewhere. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if Orton ended up winning this match. Now, shifting gears to the women, here's what I'm going to say about the Raw Women's Championship. If you're going to go here, then you win here. But if Alexa loses, we all need to bitch on Twitter and YouTube. I have no interest in seeing Sasha Banks win the belt again. We've been there. We've done that. Let's get behind Alexa Bliss a little bit more, give her a little bit more time, and maybe find somebody else for her to wrestle uh, that isn't fucking Sasha Banks. And then for the SmackDown Women's Championship, which to me is inherently more interesting, uh, will the tranny glow her way to cashing in and walking out the SmackDown Women's Champion uh, on this show? you got Naomi, Natalia, which in and of itself would be okay for the belt, especially Natalia, because it's been quite a while since she's really gotten these opportunities, best I can remember. But there's very little story here between the two of them because so much of the emphasis has been on Carmelo and to a lesser degree, uh, her escort, if you will, James Ellsworth, her heater, James Ellsworth, uh, that is just really strange. So there'd be a part that'd be kind of cool to see Natalia win There'd be a part to be kind of cool to see Naomi retain because she has been a successful champion, that's for sure. The whole stripper glow gimmick and everything else. Uh, But especially now that we don't have a men's Money in the Bank winner, it seems like we're perfectly primed in position to make a statement here with Carmella uh, cashing in on this night. And I'd be stunned if she didn't walk out the SmackDown Women's Champion at the end of the night. I really would be. Um, In terms of matches that I just, I look at them, And people probably enjoy it, and it probably will be good, but I just don't care because they've wrestled enough, and I know the only story that matters is not the story between the two guys uh, and them fighting for the U.S. title, and that's AJ Styles and Kevin Owens. I'm going to frankly look at this match the entire time and say, how do we get to Owens and McMahon at Hell in a Cell, and that's all this match is about. And that's probably all this match is going to be about. Everything's going to revolve around Shane because Shane is a McMahon. And when it comes to the McMahons, it always revolves around them at the end of the day. And there you go. So AJ Styles, Kevin Owens will probably be one of those matches where these guys will put in far too effort to bust their ass too much for too little gratification because ultimately all it's about is Owens and McMahon at the next pay-per-view any damn ways. Um, Then we've got the, the real, I almost say, lose-lose match on the card, also known as how badly can we bury Baron Corbin. And here's what I mean by a lose-lose match, a lose-lose situation. Now that you had Baron Corbin look like a total chode, cashing in and cashing in unsuccessfully on SmackDown Tuesday night, now you head into SummerSlam against the 16-time champion, the Breakfast Club warrior, John Cena. And... If Baron Corbin loses, then you, you, this is really a burial. You took the briefcase off of him and lost Cena. And you can't give this company the benefit of the doubt and say, well, they'll figure it out and they'll do, they ain't doing shit. Shut the fuck up. And you know better. You should be ashamed of yourself if you're going to defend him over this crap. But honestly, even though Baron losing makes, makes it really, really hard for him to recover and really would be tantamount to a burial... Can you really sit there and have Cena lose after just losing to Nakamura clean on television where far more people watched it? And to me, I think the answer is no. Because even though it's Cena, and I'm not buying the shit of all of a sudden now he's putting people over. (laughs) It's about eight, nine, ten goddamn years too late. Stop giving him credit for something he's too fucking late to the game on when it doesn't matter as much. But you do get into that risk of if he starts losing to everybody as kind of an overcorrection, then he's not helping anybody. He's hurting his character and as a result, by association, hurting the people that he puts over. So I don't know that Cena doing the job here is the right business decision either. And it most certainly isn't the best business decision for my SummerSlam review that I assure you because I would love nothing more than to celebrate some Breakfast Club glory in all of my parody and mocking type of ways. To me, the only way this match is not a lose-lose is to do some type of thing where Baron Corbin jumps John Cena from behind before the match even begins, and we don't have a match. Because based off of what happened, Baron Corbin has to be beyond pissed. Why would he sit there and want to wrestle a regular wrestling match against John Cena? What makes it even more ridiculous is John Cena didn't even get in a good clean shot that cost Baron Corbin his uh, chance at the title. 
To me, that's the only way you save this. So at least you give Baron Corbin some aggressiveness. You do something different with Cena. And you avoid one having to put the other over where I don't think it's really effective in either case. Because if you sit there and have Cena beat Corbin and then just send him over to fucking Raw, well, what the fuck was this whole thing about? And then if you have Corbin beat Cena, then how stupid was it to have him lose the Money in the Bank briefcase? Contract, excuse me, contract. We can't call it a fucking briefcase even though anymore. Well, if it's just a fucking contract, Vince, then how about we put a piece of paper on a clipboard and there you fucking go. Stupid ass. Uh, but... Yeah, I think it's really the lose-lose match unless we don't have a match at all. That's the only way I think this is a really productive win for anybody involved. And now we get to the two title matches. And first, the WWE Championship. Do we hinder gender and make it Shinsuke time or no? And I'm pretty sure the heavy betting favorite right now is Shinsuke. And I can understand. And a lot of fans will be really, really excited if Shinsuke wins. You know, you talk about being in Brooklyn the night after a big NXT show. You're going to have a lot of the smarky, smart crowd there. And they're going to be massively behind Shinsuke. So the ironic thing is, is even though there's not a lot of story there right now between Shinsuke and Jinder, it's kind of just been piecemealed together at the 11th hour. The dynamics of the match, Jinder's clearly going to be the heel and Shinsuke's clearly going to be the face. And it's going to have that real kind of organic crowd reaction type of feel to it that's going to be refreshing and rather welcome from my perspective. But to me, with a Shinsuke, you only get one chance to do a title right for him in WWE. And you got to make the first time right, the first time count. And to me, kind of throwing him in at the 11th hour... And having him beat Jinder for the title, I don't think particularly helps Jinder very much. And I don't know how much it really helps Shinsuke. And again, there's really not much of a story here. To me, if I'm going to take somebody like a Shinsuke and I'm going to make him a champion, then I need to get a story behind him that can really take him to another level that really can get all types of different fans to engage and invest in him. And we just don't have that right now. Frankly, Shinsuke has not been performing at a level uh, since he debuted the SmackDown after WrestleMania that in any way, shape, or form merits him being one of the two world title holders in this company. He just hasn't. And my concern is, is that even though the reaction would be big and it would be nice with him winning the belt on Sunday, it almost makes me think that jinder has got to beat somebody decent to kind of establish himself and this is an opportunity here, especially because even with the Singh brothers, even if he went with the cookie cutter chicken shit heel tactics at this point in time, just because you can go with the belt on Shinsuke at this point doesn't mean you need to and doesn't mean you should. And I don't know that they should at this point. Yeah, Jinder is not a great champion, but do you really envision Shinsuke being a great champion? Where do you go from here? Who does he feud with after that? I mean, there are a lot of different factors to, f- to f- figure out and fit into the mix so if I had to be say I was going to be potentially surprised by anything it could be that gender beats Shinsuke because everybody thinks Shinsuke is going to win so the WWE kind of try to troll everybody and we've got so many different avenues for gender to walk out the champion we might go there and that's what I wonder if they're going to do Um, But we really then get to the one match that I've cared about the most. The one match that feels like it belongs truly on SummerSlam. The one match that has the story, that has the characters, that has the power of personality to a certain degree, that screams out and says, this should be the main event of a WrestleMania of the summer of a Big Four pay-per-view. And that is this Raw Universal Championship match with Reigns and Strowman and Joe and Lesnar. This thing feels like it's going to be massive. This thing feels like it could potentially be epic. This thing feels like, even for those that are disenfranchised with the turn towards the vanilla midgets that the WWE has made in recent years, that this is the match that's going to point them to it and say, oh my God, wrestling can still be like this. Oh my God, look at these badasses. Oh my God, look at these big dudes. It's nice to see this every once in a fucking while. And I can't lie, it's going to be nice to see this on Sunday night. It's a major reason to watch this show for me. Like if it was in the old pay-per-view days, what would be the primary reason I'd be forking over big money to buy the pay-per-view? It would be because of this Raw Universal Title 4-Way. 
It's really a money match to me, a money four-way where I think you've got six different possible outcomes. Four of the outcomes could be one of these guys winning. I got to be honest, I think Lesnar winning and winning clean is stupid. You're getting ready to head an NFL season. The last thing you need is a part-time champion. I'm just saying. They really don't need a part-time champion. I don't think they've gotten a whole lot of mileage and uh, success out of Lesnar's title run this time. It's frankly kind of sort of almost been forgettable. <clears throat> Joe was more memorable than him in uh, the last pay-per-view match in terms of the build-up to it and everything else. Um, so you can always have Lesnar retain. But if he did that, then what's the whole point of putting this four-way together? Because in part, the reason of putting the four-way together would be to not have Lesnar involved in the decision in any way, shape, or form. So you still keep the element of maybe he should be the champion, but he's not the champion anymore. But you could set up some type of return match in the future, but several potential return matches with the other three guys in this match. You could always go with Lesnar, but to me, having him win here is just beyond idiotic. Um, you've got the Roman Reigns factor. And never doubt, with him being a WWE golden boy, that they could just say, fuck it, we're not going to wait until WrestleMania. We're going to have him pin Brock Lesnar right here. And that is very possible. Very possible. Because of no other reason than you look at it and you say, okay, Roman's our boy. He hasn't had the belt for a little while. Uh, maybe we don't want to wait till WrestleMania. Maybe we just want to get it out of the way now. So there's that possibility. You could go with Samoa Joe winning on his own and that would definitely work it probably out of the four guys would get the single biggest reaction of the night although a close second would be Braun Strowman winning clean pinning either Joe or especially Roman um, the Cena element of this him coming over to Raw it'll be interesting to see which of these four guys he would work with after SummerSlam uh, and that could determine a lot of what's going to happen here but Strowman the ultimate question is going to be uh, with a lot of the momentum he has, even though I do feel like in a lot of ways it's just because he's working with Roman, uh, the iron's hot right now. And usually you should strike while the iron is hot. So you have arguments for each of those four guys winning on their own. To me, there's also two other options that could happen here. One is you could have The Undertaker come make an appearance. You've got Lesnar and Reigns, two guys, the only two guys in history to beat him at WrestleMania. The one guy, Lesnar, ended the streak. The other guy, Reigns, in theory, ended his career. So you could have The Undertaker get involved. You could have him help a Samoa Joe or a Braun Strowman. And could you imagine the reaction if the gong hit, the lights went out, and the Taker just appeared in the middle of the ring in Brooklyn? That place would come unglued. And it might be a perfect cap to this. But I do think, even though I don't know how likely it's going to be at this point, I think the thing that would be the most beneficial would be to have Samoa Joe win because Brock Lesnar got screwed over by Paul Heyman and have Paul Heyman align himself with Samoa Joe. Look, at some point in time, you need to shake things up with Lesnar a little bit differently. And you probably want to get a little more mileage out of Heyman on TV. And having Heyman associated with Lesnar means that Heyman himself is a part-time performer. And for the WWE, they need anybody, everybody that could possibly talk and captivate some people, and Heyman can do that, even though I think some of his work recently has been pretty repetitive. The fact is, is you want to get him on TV more, and the best way to do that is have him aligned with a new champion. And imagine what type of statement that would make for a Samoa Joe to be aligned with a Paul Heyman. Like, Paul Heyman thought so much of Samoa Joe, especially after the first match, where he becomes the advocate for the Samoan submission machine. He chose Samoa Joe over Brock Lesnar and all the things that him and Brock Lesnar have done together this five-year run in WWE this go-round. I mean, just imagine the thought of what could happen here. I think the lamest possible finish would be to have Lesnar win. I really do. You know, even Reigns winning would be incredibly lame, but imagine the reaction of hate to close out the night. Uh, Joe and Strowman scream out is clearly the two best options. You know, there's a very big argument to make for Strowman walking out the champion, but I think in terms of business, in terms of situation, in terms of the flexibility of what you can do, especially since you've already kind of teased uh, Joe and Roman continuing a program post-SummerSlam and the way they've kind of been going at each other, I think the guy that absolutely makes the most sense right now is Samoa Joe, especially thinking about a guy like John Cena coming over to Raw. So I do think Samoa Joe wins. 
the Universal Championship, and I really hope it comes because Paul Heyman turned on Brock Lesnar and aligned himself with Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe winning the belt in and of itself would be a big deal. Samoa Joe winning the belt and Paul Heyman aligning himself with Samoa Joe gives everybody something to talk about and gives everybody a reason to tune in the next night on Raw. So that's what I think. I think Joe wins. I think there's a very strong chance, believe it or not, that gender might retain. I might be crazy. You can come back on afterwards and laugh at me about it. Uh, but man, I look at this show and I just don't see where this show is going to be all that great. You've given me so much of it ahead of time. And a lot of the main card matches just do not interest me whatsoever. And I'm sorry. Even as much as I'm looking forward to that Universal Title 4-Way. That's one match in potentially six hours of show between kickoff and main card. That's not enough. The WWE is being even lazier than they usually are with all the multi-people matches. You know, this is part of the fucked up part about, you know, this show has a champion, this show has a champion, this show has this champion, this show has that champion. You got too many freaking titles, too many champions, nobody stands out, nobody special, which apparently is just the way WWE likes it. All I can hope for comes Sunday night is that SummerSlam doesn't suck. Is that too much to ask? 